What is socialism? I learned in school when I was a kid that socialism is everyone gets paid the exact same wage no matter how hard they work. And so then everyone's lazy because that's bad, what socialism is. I've had other people, the more common definition you get now is socialism is whenever the government does anything. The government does something, that's socialism. The USA, I've heard, is half socialist and half capitalist because we have social security in the post office and the US military, but we also have private companies. Um, there's, there's many different definitions of socialism. The first, uh, the first use of the word socialism was in France. It was Henry Saint-Simon, and he was a French, uh, you know, religious man who was worried that after the French Revolution, all these people were unemployed, and factory owners at that point were like raping women who worked in their factories and mistreating them, and, and it, was, it, was, it was a feeling there was something wrong with liberalism, which was the ideology of the French Revolution. They didn't say they believed in capitalism, they said they believed in liberalism individual rights. And Henry St. Simone said, well, maybe in contrast to this liberalism, we need socialism. But he never really explained what it was. But he did a lot of charity work. And he opened some cooperative businesses. And that was Henry St. Simone. And he used the word socialism in French. The first person to use the word socialism in English was Robert Owen. And Robert Owen was a Welsh factory owner. And he started a, a colony called New Lanark. And it was a cooperative you know, commune that existed in Scotland for a while, he eventually moved it to Indiana and set it up in the U.S. state of Indiana. It was called New Harmony. And it's still there. You can see it. It's a nice little, they got a museum there. And it was this cooperative that Robert Owen built. And he actually addressed a, a session of the U.S. Congress and gave a lecture on socialism. He was the first guy to coin the term socialism. But Karl Marx distinguished scientific socialism from utopian socialism. Henry St. Simone, Robert Owen, others, they were utopian socialists. But Karl Marx described himself as a scientific socialist, and he described socialism this way. He said, we have seen above that the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of the ruling class and to win the battle for democracy. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie, to centralize all instruments of production into the hands of the state, and of the proletariat organized as the ruling class, and to increase the productive forces as rapidly as possible. That's what Karl Marx laid out as his vision of socialism. Now, Frederick Engels, he described socialism. He said, the proletariat seizes the public power, and by means of this transforms the socialized means of production, slipping from the hands of the bourgeoisie into public property. By this act, the proletariat frees the means of production from the character of capital they have borne thus far, and gives their socialized character complete freedom to work itself out. Socialized production upon a predetermined plan becomes possible. The development of production makes the existence of different classes of society henceforth an anachronism. In proportion, as anarchy and social production vanishes, the political authority of the state eventually dies out. Man at last is the master of his own form of social organization, and he becomes at the same time the lord over nature, his own master, free. To accomplish this act of universal emancipation is the historical mission of the proletariat, to thoroughly comprehend the historical conditions and this very nature of this act, to impart to the now oppressed proletarian class a full knowledge of the conditions and of the meaning of this momentous act is called upon to accomplish. This is the task or the theoretical expression of the proletarian movement of scientific socialism. So what is the idea? Well, the idea is in capitalism, you have these means of production that are privately owned. And under capitalism, profit is the basis of the economy. Houses and buildings like this don't get built because people need a nice place to have classes. They're built so that landlords and bankers can make profit. Food isn't produced so that people can eat it. Food is produced so that agribusiness and big box stores can make money by selling it. Profit is the basis of the economy. And socialism is when the proletariat, the working class, the majority of society, takes control of the government, and then through the government, seizes control of the means of production. The economy is then forced to work in the interests of society overall. You have production upon a predetermined plan rather than production for profit. And that's the difference between capitalism and socialism. And it's pretty vague. Um, I recently debated a, a advocate of more liberal social democratic capitalism. And he kept insisting that in my defense of socialism that I lay out and, and, and explain exactly what things would be nationalized and what things would not be nationalized. Well, that's, that's Robert Owen. Robert Owen would do that, right? Um, Henry St. Simon might do that. But that's utopianism. Socialism comes about due to this contradiction between the worker and the capitalist, and eventually driving the workers to rise up and seize control of the means of production. And socialism looks very, very different. 
And Marx predicted that socialism would happen first in the first world. He was existing in the period of industrial capitalism. And he assumed eventually the workers would just rise up and seize control of their factories. That's not what happened, because capitalism moved on to its period of imperialism, where you had the labor aristocracy and the rising standard of living in the first world. And it was countries in the developing world breaking out of the control of Western bankers. That was what socialism was. It was countries around the world that had been kept in feudal or semi-feudal conditions and been unable to develop because of imperialism. And it was them rising up, seizing control of their economies, and building socialism. The Russian Revolution, the Bolsheviks take power. And at that point, you had 15 different countries invade Russia, what became the Soviet Union. And you had a country that was blockaded. You had a country that was in very feudal, it was mainly a feudal country. There was industry, industry in the cities, but it was mainly a feudal, impoverished country. And out of the Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik struggle to hold on to power, you had a political model that kind of defined socialism in the 20th century. And it's generally referred to in academia as real socialism or really existing socialism. People who don't like it will call it Stalinism. But that political model developed. And that was the socialism of the Cold War. You have the state controlling the major industries. You have five-year economic plans in which the population is mobilized to build. People who work in factories and work extra hard, they get a reward. In the Soviet Union, they call it staccanovism. Um, and uh, you have a one party. The Communist Party tends to be the ruling party. Um, and you have almost a political structure that, in a way, almost kind of mimics feudalism. You have the leader, and his face is everywhere. Uh, you have the state almost kind of taking on the role of the church and, and putting out ideology with a single party, and the economy is planned. And, and this, this model of really existing socialism was very successful in raising countries out of poverty. And you wouldn't know that if you watch American media or you attend American universities. But real huge economic achievements were carried out due to really existing socialism, right? There's a good book called uh, The Soviet Economy Since 1917 by Maurice Dobb, and he describes how they launched their five-year plans in 1928, and by 1938, they had multiplied the rate of electricity 10 times. The coal production had increased three and a half times. There were 20 new tramway systems. There were 80 new bus systems. The number of hospital beds in rural areas doubled. And by 1938, the Soviet Union actually had a larger tractor production apparatus than any other country in the entire world. They also led the world in locomotive and train manufacturing. You have to remember, at that time, the rest of the world was having the Great Depression. And Louis Fisher, who was writing for The Nation, he said, the Soviet frontier is like a charmed circle in which the world economic crisis cannot cross. While banks crash, while production falls, and trade languishes abroad, the Soviet Union continues in an orgy of construction and national development. The scale and speed of its progress is unprecedented. The first mobile phone was patented in 1957. They actually, by 1985, they had developed their own home computer system, the VK0010. Uh, and all these economic achievements happened, and the whole world was kind of in awe of what the Soviet Union was doing. There was a NATO treaty that made it illegal to share any technology with them. But despite that, they had amazing breakthroughs. Um, the Encyclopedia Britannica, when they wrote the entry for Joseph Stalin in 1956, this is a sentence from their entry. It says, he found Russia working with wooden plows and left it equipped with atomic piles. Now, W.E.B. Du Bois, the beloved African-American intellectual, he says, quote, what I saw in the Soviet Union was more than the triumph of physics. It was the growth of a nation's soul, the confidence of a great people, and its plan and the future. We begun to recognize the Soviet Republic as giving its people the best education of any in the world, excelling in sciences, and organizing industry at the highest levels. Uh, the New York Times in 1931 marveled at the Soviet Union's educational achievements. They, this is from the New York Times, 1931, December 1st. There seems to be no parallel in history to the drive for learning in all branches of knowledge, from reading and writing to the abstruses of science, as is now in progress in the Soviet Union. Before the revolution, only 7 million children attended school. Now there are 23 million. Fraser Hunt who was an American, uh, American uh, journalist, he was writing for the New York American, he said, quote, Japan, westernizing and industrializing itself 50 years ago, was doing child's play compared to what the Soviet Union is doing today. Already, almost overnight, the USSR has become an industrial country. The Soviet Union also had a huge impact on global culture. For example, the, the fact that nowadays racism is considered to be a bad thing. 
That has a lot to do with the Soviet Union. It was the Soviet Union, from its inception, believed the notion that one race is superior to another was false and fought against it and inserted that into public consciousness. That was something people believed all over the world. W.B. Du Bois, an African-American man who studied in the Soviet Union, said, the Soviet Union seems to be the only European country where people are not more or less taught to look down on some class, group, or race. I know countries where race and color prejudice show only slight manifestations, but no white country where race and color prejudice seem so absolutely absent. That was W.E.B. Du Bois. And it's largely understood that the birth of the modern civil rights movement of the United States, where Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, became a household name, was after the lynching of Emmett Till, right? He was an African-American man who was accused of whistling at a white woman. Uh, the owners of the store came and killed him and were acquitted in court. Well, the reason that that case created such a huge splash was because the Soviet Union took the image of Emmett Till's mutilated body and sent it all over the world and humiliated the United States. The Cold War was going on, and, and the, United, uh, the United States was saying that we're a land of freedom and these are communist dictators. And then the Soviet Union just held up that picture and said, oh, really? That's, that's your idea of freedom? And it was in that context that the northern wing of the Democratic Party started to move against the rival wing of the Democratic Party, the Dixiecrats of the U.S. South. The Soviet Union had a lot to do with writing the U.N. Charter in the aftermath of the Second World War and condemning racism and bigotry. The Soviet Union also gave huge amounts of support to people in Africa that were fighting against colonialism and imperialism. And that also forced the United States to address the issue of racism. And everywhere that really existing socialism came into being, it had huge economic breakthroughs. I mean, and, and you don't have to listen to them. You don't have to take their word for it. I mean, a great resource is the U.S. Library of Congress. Uh, they, the Federal Research Division of the Library of Congress published, has published a study of every country in the world. And this is their study of Romania, a very poor country in Eastern Europe. This is what it says. It says, between 1950 and 1971, the number of hospital beds per 1,000 people more than doubled in Romania. The number of doctors per 1,000 people increased by 25%. The infant mortality re rate was reduced by 75% from 1950 to 1984. In 1945, only 27% of the people were able to read and write. However, by 1966, illiteracy was eradicated. By 1970, the number of teachers had tripled, and the number of university professors in Romania had gone from only 2,000 before the Second World War to 13,000. Right? For a very small, impoverished country, these are big, dramatic changes. Right? If you take a country and you, you expand access to health care, you wipe out illiteracy, you expand universities, you, I mean, this is huge. This is very, very big. People who say socialism has failed everywhere it's ever been tried, it's never accomplished anything, just doesn't match the facts. Cuba is very famous for its accomplishments, especially in the field of health care. I'm reading from The Guardian. Cuba's literacy rate is at 100% and its life expectancy parallels first world nations, despite limited funding and supplies. The country's high ratio of doctors to patients and its proactive community-centered approach to healthcare has long been the envy of many first world countries, not the least the United Kingdom. Um, you know, Cuba, uh, UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon said that their medical school is the most advanced medical school in the world. Um, so that's their achievements. And, I mean, even after the fall of the Soviet Union and the economic hardships, you know, you can look at the CIA World Factbook and compare the life expectancies between Cuba and the surrounding countries. Cuba's life expectancy is 78.9 years, about the same as the United States. Dominican Republic, 71 years. Jamaica, 74 years. Honduras, 71 years. Guyana, 68 years. Mexico, 76 years. Guatemala, 71 years. Haiti, 64 years. Right? I mean, it's pretty dramatic that the socialist system has done a lot to improve people's lives in Cuba. Of course, we're not going to hear about that in the United States. It's also funny that, you know, we'll often hear about North Korea and the economic hardships that North Korea has had since the 1990s, the fall of the Soviet Union, the food shortages. But this is actually from an article from the BBC published in 2008. This is what they said about North Korea's economic development. At one time, North Korea's centrally planned economy seemed to work well, indeed. In the initial years after the creation of North Korea following World War II, with spectacular results, the mass mobilization of the population, along with Soviet and Chinese technical assistance and financial aid, resulted in annual growth rates estimated to have reached 20 and 30 percent in the years following the devastating Korean War. As late as the 1970s, South Korea languished in the shadow of the, quote, economic miracle north of the border. Now, obviously, they've had problems during the 1990s and the fall of the Soviet Union, 
But the fact that there were huge achievements in industrialization, that, that you know, they built hospitals all over the country, they wiped out illiteracy in the country, they, they industrialized the country, again, gets kind of glossed over. Remember, socialism just fails everywhere it's ever been tried. And that's, that was really existing socialism, and that was the model that kind of defined the Cold War. And obviously that model had big problems in terms of human rights and the way people were treated. Um, and it had big problems in terms of, of you know, not having a market sector and, and people that were intellectuals and academics kind of being stifled and stuck. But we've had other forms of socialism that have come into existence. For example, in the Arab world, right, you had Baathist Arab socialism. And that was a political movement. Uh, Baath means rebirth in Arabic. And there was a guy named Michel Aflaq, and he was a Syrian, and he was in the Communist Party. But when the Second World War broke out, the Communist Party of Syria was basically saying that the French, that, that there had to be peace with the French occupiers. And he, being a Syrian who didn't like French colonialism, broke with the Communist Party and formed his own party, the Baathist Party. And the Baathist Party eventually took power in Iraq, it eventually took power in, in Syria. Um, we've also seen other forms of Arab socialism. There was Arab socialism in Egypt with Abdel Nasser, there was Islamic socialism in Libya. Let's talk about what Baathist Arab socialism has done in Syria. And the Soviet Union provided Syria with $100 million to build the Takba Dam on the Euphrates River. It's considered to be the backbone of all economic development in Syria. For the first time in Syria's history, the country achieved full primary school enrollment for males and 85% of females also enrolled in school. In 1981, 42% of Syria's adult population was illiterate. By 1991, according to the United Nations, they had wiped out illiteracy in the country. Between 1970 and 2009, the life expectancy in Syria increased by 17 years. During this time, the infant mortality rate dramatically dropped from 132 deaths per 1,000 live births to only 17. And that's according to the Evincia Journal of Medicine. And they, they just kind of marveled at what the Syrian Baathist Arab Socialist government did in terms of bringing access to health care to the population. And the US Library of Congress country study describes the Baathist government of Syria saying it was known for massive expenditures for the development of irrigation, electricity, water, road building projects, and the expansion of health services and education to rural areas. The increases in the standard of living in Syria under the Baathist Arab Socialist government have been dramatic. You see all these articles coming out, and they're just, they can't understand why all these people in Syria would fight against, uh, against the, the extremists and religious fanatics that want to overthrow the Syrian government. Well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that the Syrian government has so dramatically improved people's living standards. It also has a lot to do with the fact that the Syrian government protects religious minorities, like Christians, like Alawites, and others, who would be persecuted if the extremists that are trying to overthrow the Syrian government came to power. But the Western media just can't understand why Syrians would want to defend the Baathist Arab Socialist government. Well, they should read what the Library of Congress says. It pretty dramatically explains it. You know, in, in the 2000s, uh, we've seen the rise of Bolivarian socialism in Latin America. That's a different model. It's governments that are elected, um, and the elections are kind of referendums on Western neoliberalism. These Bolivarian governments have come to power, and they've had dramatic achievements. In Nicaragua, uh, the construction projects uh, uh, have overall uh, reduced poverty by roughly 30%. Um, the GDP of Nicaragua, since the Sandinistas came to power, back into power in 2006, the GDP has gone up by 36%. Uh, the World Happiness Report, published by the United Nations, lists Nicaragua as having the greatest increase in happiness of any country in 2017. Bolivia, which nationalized its oil and natural gas production, um, it actually uh, has seen very dramatic increases in the standard of living. Uh, the rate of illiteracy in Bolivia when Morales came to power was 16%. Now, according to the United Nations, there is no illiteracy in Bolivia. And it was Cuban volunteers who came in and wiped out illiteracy. Uh, the Bolivian government under Evo Morales has built roads all over the country in places they didn't have them before. This is, this is according to Bloomberg News. By 2017, Bolivia was 42% richer than when Morales took office. 42% richer. Right? Poverty has declined by 25% since he was elected. That's Bloomberg News that is admitting the dramatic economic achievements. And Venezuela, they've recently had their hardships, but, you know, in 1998, before Hugo Chavez was elected, Venezuela only had 12 public universities. Now it has 32 public universities. Free health care is provided to all citizens in Venezuela by Cuban volunteers. Uh, they have free heating and cooking gas. Adult illiteracy has been wiped out. Between 1995 and 2009, poverty in Venezuela has decreased by 50%. 
They have interest-free loans for people to buy loans. I actually walked through a neighborhood in Caracas where every single house had been paid for by an interest-free loan provided by the Bolivarian government. Uh, they have cheap public transportation, and all of this is paid for by state-controlled oil resources. I just want to go over some of the wonders of the world that have been built by socialism. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is the Aswan Dam in Egypt. Abdel Nasser, the Arab socialist leader who was elected president of Egypt, uh, he teamed up with the Soviet Union and they built the biggest hydroelectrical power plant in the Middle East and it electrified all of Egypt. There were whole sections of Egypt that had never had electricity and he electrified all of Egypt and it was built by Soviet technicians and Egyptians mobilized by a socialist government. The China-Pakistan Friendship Highway. It's one of the highest and longest paved roads in the world. 810 miles long and it's very high elevated. It was built in an alliance between China and Pakistan in 1966. The Great Man-Made River of Libya, that's the world's largest irrigation system. It is the largest irrigation system in the world. It was very damaged in 2011 during the Libyan War, but it's still functional. It was built by the Islamic Socialist Government of Gaddafi. They built the world's largest irrigation system, enabled Libya to start growing their own food on a much bigger scale. It was very dramatic. The Soviet space program. No one ever talks about the fact the Soviet Union had the first satellite. The Soviet Union had the first person in outer space. During the 1930s, the Soviet Union built the Dnieper Dam, which was at that point the biggest hydroelectric power plant in the world. Well, it's not the biggest hydroelectric power plant in the world anymore. Today, the biggest hydroelectric power plant in the world is actually the Three Gorges Dam in China, a government-controlled uh, hydroelectric power plant that was built by the socialist government. And the China Railway Corporation is at this point making the fastest trains in the world. And I just wanted to end this section by talking about an example that I think clearly illustrates the difference between capitalism and socialism. And that's what happened in China in July of 2015. July 8th and 9th of 2015, the Chinese stock market dropped by roughly 30%. 1,400 companies filed for a trading halt. Imagine if that happened in the United States. 55% of the population of the United States is directly tied into the stock market. A 30% drop on the stock market. There would be riots in the streets. Food would not be delivered to stores. It would result in an utter societal collapse. And that didn't happen in China. In fact, less than 6% of the Chinese population is in any way tied into the stock market. And on July 8th and 9th, the Chinese government stepped in with what they called anti-selling measures. The Communist Party announced that anyone caught short selling or betting that a stock would go down would be immediately arrested. They also banned uh, all shareholders, all major shareholders from selling any of their stocks for six months. The state-owned enterprises followed government direction and were carefully managed. And like two weeks later, the Chinese stock market had dramatically gone up again, right? Because the Chinese economy is not centered around the profits of the people on the stock market. It's centered around the state. The state controls the means of production. The stock market simply exists as a vehicle for bringing in foreign investment. And, and because of that, they were able to just dramatically recover from an event that would have wiped us out in the United States. Why? Because profits are not in command. You know, there are difficulties in socialist countries. There have been many bad things that have been done. But this notion that you can't have socialism and have growth. Socialism has created a huge, huge amount of economic growth in the world. It has proved that a society without profits and command can make dramatic improvements, raising people out of poverty, electrifying, uh, wiping out illiteracy. I mean, huge achievements have happened under the leadership of socialist governments.